So our volunteers caught us up to speed. There's our recap. You know where we're at in the story. God has just told Habakkuk, you got to write this stuff down. I'm going to talk to you about these evil Babylonians. And he gets into what are called the five woe oracles. Okay, this is God speaking to Habakkuk, and he has five woes directed at the Babylonians. And we're going to deal with the first two of them today. We're not actually going to deal with the first two of them a lot. We actually need to talk way more about what a woe is before we can deal with the rest of the five woes. But we're covering the section of scriptures that cover those first two woes. So there's a couple questions we need to ask as we get into these woe articles. And I'm going to do a quick summary exposition of the text before I jump into our main question of today. First question is, who are these? Okay, if you look down at verse 6 with me, it says, Won't all of these take up a taunt against him? Whenever you see something like that in your Bible, people like to say, Oh, I don't like the Old Testament. I can't understand it. It doesn't make any sense. That's because they rip right through it and forget to ask the right questions. Who are these? Won't all of these take up a problem with you? A mockery and riddles? Well, the these are the people we saw in verse 5. Verse 5 of chapter 2, Nebuchadnezzar is the evil Babylonian king. He's the granddaddy of Belshazzar, the daddy of Nebuchadnezzar. Nebuchadnezzar is the guy we're talking about here. It says he gathers all the nations to himself. He collects all the peoples for himself. All of the people that Nebuchadnezzar is going to plunder and loot and take into prison and, prison and slavery, those people are the ones that will have their vindication, is what God's saying. These, what God is saying is, although these people are going to be taken prisoner, they're going to be taken out by the Babylonians, many of them are going to get killed, I'm not going to let it go unpunished. There will be justice for these people. There will be vindication for these people. It's kind of like in the Garden of Eden. When God goes up to Cain and he's like, where's your brother? Cain's like, I don't know. God's like, look, his blood is crying out from the rocks. That's the same idea here. This hasn't gone unnoticed. It might seem terrible and awful, but I, the Lord, see that and I'm going to deal with it. So when he says these, he's promising that there will be vindication for the people. Babylon is going to take. The next question is, I thought this was just interesting. Won't all of these take up a taunt against him? And I think it's important for us to know what we're dealing with. I've mentioned before that Habakkuk is written in Hebrew poetry. So if there's parts of it don't, don't make a lot of sense, read it back in Hebrew and it should be more clear. Uh, but it's Hebrew poetry, so it can be hard to, hard to talk about. And the Hebrews had a genre of literature that you and I don't employ very often today. It's called the taunt. It was a proverbial derogatory chant. So literally, what you're hearing is like a grade school child's derogatory chant, taunt thing against the evil Babylonians. And God is saying all these things are just going to come back to bite him. That's what this taunt is with mockery and riddles. Literally, we're being told the rest of what we're going to read is mockery and riddles, rhetorical questions, things that will answer themselves about the Babylonians. So, for instance, when God says, won't your creditors suddenly arise and get you? Well, the answer is yes, the creditors are going to arise and get you. It's a taunt. It's kind of a riddle chant. And then our main question for discussion today, and this is where we're going to spend most of our time, is what is a woe? What is a woe? We have two hermeneutical principles we want to employ here. First of all, what interprets Scripture? Oh, you all have to know this better than that. What interprets Scripture? Scripture. Scripture interprets Scripture. And then what do we have to see around a Scripture before we can interpret it? Context. Context. So we got to get the context of a woe, and we got to get other Scriptures to help us know what a woe means. We can't just assume a woe means what you and I think it means. So we have to ask the question, what is a woe? Well, I looked into this, and I found out that a certain gentleman in our New Testament said woe the most of anyone. If there's an award going out for who said woe the most, it went out to this one guy. Anybody guess what that guy might have been? Jesus. It was Jesus. It was judge not peace and love Jesus that said this the most, which I thought was really interesting. Because you don't think of Jesus, and not a lot of people have their Pinterest backgrounds as a verse of Jesus saying, woe to you. It's not often one of the ones we see. But Jesus said it the most. In fact, I'm going to take you over to Matthew. And in Matthew chapter 23, we see eight of the ten woes that Jesus talks about. Let's just look at a couple of these. Matthew chapter 23, verse 13. 
Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, you hypocrites. Verse 14. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, you hypocrites. No, oh, Jesus doesn't like hypocrites. For those of you that are just catching up, Jesus is not a big fan of them. Verse 15. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites. Verse 16. Woe to you, blind guides, who say, whoever takes an oath by the sanctuary means nothing. Verse 23. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites. Verse 25. Can you guess what he's going to say in 25? Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, you hypocrites. Verse 27. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites. You're looking for your next tattoo idea. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites. Verse 29. Jesus says it a couple more times in the New Testament. But the man who used the word woe the most is Jesus, which is pretty consistent with what we're reading in the Old Testament. The Old Testament is inspired by God, and Jesus is God. And all God deals with different people in different times, different ways, God's character does not change. In fact, our Bible tells us that God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. So for the God of the Old Testament to say woe to you Babylonians is very consistent with when Jesus comes and he's God incarnate and he sees evil in the land, he says woe to you. It's very consistent with God's character for Jesus to use the same words that we see in our Old Testament. So woe, Jesus said it the most, and the context tells us that this is essentially a judgment. You could insert the word woe with judgment. Everywhere you see woe, you could just say a judgment is against them, and you'd have a good definition of the word woe. There is God's judgment on people who he pronounces woe against. God's judgment is on them. Now, as I go through Matthew 23, and we see that this judgment is mostly on the scribes and the Pharisees, and as we go through Habakkuk, and we're going to see that all the woe that God calls down is on the Babylonians, you might be saying, this doesn't have a lot to do with me. I'm not a Babylonian warlord, and I'm not a scribe and a Pharisee. So why do I need to deal with what this woe is in the Bible? Why do I need to deal with what this judgment is? Well, the problem is that Jesus focuses on our heart. And one of the things he was really quick to hit the scribes and Pharisees with, the scribes and Pharisees, they were, they were good boys. They prayed, they read their Bibles, they thought they were righteous and upright men. But as we saw with Jesus' short interaction with them, what Jesus quickly did with the scribes and Pharisees is they had set a legalistic bar. Of course, we've heard it said that legalism is not raising a standard for you to live up to, but rather demoting God's law to something you can keep and try to keep it. That's what legalism is. And the Pharisees had taken this standard and they made it easy for them to keep. Which we know from our Old Testament that nobody can keep God's law. None of us can. All of us are sinners. We all fall short of the glory of God. The Pharisees had deluded and rationalized themselves to the point where they believed they could take God's law and bring it down to their level where they could keep it, and then they were trying to keep it. And Jesus comes along and he says, okay, yeah, you haven't stolen anything. That's nice. You ever coveted something? And then they start getting quieter. And Jesus says, oh, wow, you've never murdered anyone. That's awesome. Have you ever hated anybody? And they start getting even quieter. And then they're all like, man, we've never committed adultery. And God says, have you ever looked on someone with lust? And at this point, you can hear a pin drop, and the scribes and the Pharisees are starting to back out the door because they don't like this guy. He's taking a standard that they put down here, and he's taking it back up to the level where it should be, where no man can keep it, because no man can keep God's law. Jesus loves to take the standards that we'll set for ourselves and rip them away by putting the standard on our hearts. And that is why when we see judgment being called down on Pharisees and Sadducees who had a heart problem of anger and lust and murder, you and I get to put ourselves in the same category because we've got the same heart problem. Sure, we haven't persecuted the Christians and we're not there for the crucifixion of Jesus, but we have the same heart of flesh inside of us as the scribes and Pharisees. And it doesn't take long of comparing your heart to God's law to figure that out. And then when I go in here and I see these Babylonians, the first woe, woe to him who amasses what is not his. How much longer will he load himself with goods? Well, goodness. Not all of us are warlords here. I doubt any of you have taken a small country by storm and taken it over for what it is for yourselves. But it doesn't say woe to Babylonian warlords. It says woe to him who takes what's not his. And how many of us can say we've taken what isn't ours before? 
Oh, come on, liars. Put your hands up. That's right. Thank you. We've all taken stuff that's not ours before. And so when we look at this problem of woe, we have to ask what woe is. And then when we see that Jesus is the one who said it the most and who he said it about, you and I get to realize that we share the woe problem with Nebuchadnezzar. What happens a lot of times when we read the Bible is it seems like some stories about people that were far away and it really doesn't have anything to do with us and it seems unrelatable. This is very relatable because you and I share the woe problem with the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the Babylonians. Anyone who is standing short of God's law finds themselves with a woe problem, a judgment of God problem. There's also a bigger problem we have to deal with here, and I'm going to come back to what we deal with our woe problem. So I want you to put a pin in that, and I want you to remember, I have a woe problem. Can you say that with me? I have a woe problem. Good. Now hold on to that, because I'm going to come back to it later. But I want to tell you about a bigger problem. This is one of those stories where the news gets worse before it gets better. Okay? Now I'm going to read from chapter 2, verse 10. This was read by Eddie Forrest. You have planned shame for your house by wiping out many peoples and sinning against your own self. Okay, Nebuchadnezzar has sinned against himself. Seems straightforward, right? But for those of you that have been following along with Habakkuk, as you're brushing out your memories, you remember chapter 1, verse 6, where we find out something else about the Babylonians. So chapter 1, verse 6, God says this, Look! I am raising up the Babylonians, that bitter, impetuous nation that marches across the earth's open spaces to seize territories not its own. Well, now, God just said he's raising up an evil nation that takes stuff that's not their own. But the passage we just read over here says he sinned against himself and taken things that aren't his own. So which is it? Those of you that are students of logic, has Nebuchadnezzar sinned against himself? Or has God raised him up to do these things? Is he doing them or is God doing them? Oh, exactly. The answer to that question is yes. Now, I want to describe to you something, and I'm going to borrow Doug Wilson's analogy because it's better than anyone I can come up with. When we're dealing with issues like this, we have a text that tells us Nebuchadnezzar is doing it, and we also have a text that tells us God is doing it. You have to realize that there are two perspectives. There is God's perspective, and there is our perspective. Doug Wilson puts it like this. If you and I were to go to the theater and we wanted to watch the play Hamlet and Hamlet gets up on that theater and he says, to be or not to be, that is the problem. Who just said that? Hamlet or Shakespeare? Well, Hamlet said it, but who wrote the play? Shakespeare said it too. Shakespeare saying it through his character Hamlet but Hamlet is also expressing his desires and what he wants to do. And we have this weird place of two levels. And this analogy falls very short when we compare it to the sovereignty of God. But we're in a spot with some weird levels. We've got an earthly perspective and we've got a heavenly perspective. In the heavenly perspective, God says, I'm raising up the Babylonians and they're going to take what's not theirs. And then on the earthly, per earthly perspective, I've got Nebuchadnezzar. The king of the golden age of the Babylonians who says, I'm going to go take them out and I'm going to take what's not mine. And I've got Nebuchadnezzar choosing to sin and do terrible things. And I've got God directing his steps and turning his heart wherever he wants to. And I'm stuck with a two-layer problem here. Now, as we get into that, the answer to our issue here is um, bondage. Bondage of the human heart. I'm going to read a couple of verses for you that are going to make it a little more clear. This is why I'm finally getting around to my sermon title, A Captured Heart. Today, that is what we are talking about, a captured heart. Where is your heart in bondage? Now, we know about Nebuchadnezzar's heart, and I'm going to read a couple of verses to you from my 3 by 5 card here. 2 Peter chapter 2, 19. While they promised them liberty, they themselves are slaves of corruption. For by whom a pagan, a person is overcome, by him also is he brought into bondage. There's that word again. Slaves of corruption. Nebuchadnezzar does not fear the one true God. Second Peter tells me that's because he's a slave of corruption. You know what Nebuchadnezzar's going to do? 
the evil things that he wants to do. And that's all that people ask is going to do. Then I get down to John 8, 4, 4. And Jesus says this. You are of your father, the devil, and your will is to do your father's desires. So Jesus is telling a bunch of unregenerate, unrepentant, sinning, unbelieving people. He says, your father is the devil. And what you want to do is what he wants you to do. Does that sound a little bit like slaves of corruption, slaves to sin? Yeah. Okay, it should. And then in Galatians 5.1, I've got this. For freedom Christ has set us free. Stand firm, therefore, and do not submit again to the yoke of slavery. So now we're on the opposite side of that. Paul's talking to some believers in Galatians, and he's like, guys, you were set free from that slavery. You were set free from that bondage. Don't submit to the slavery of sin again. All throughout Scripture, we have this idea that people like Nebuchadnezzar, people like the scribes and Pharisees, people like you and me, are not the masters of their own fate. We're slaves of sin and corruption. All our righteousness is as filthy rags. So here we are. If you're unregenerate, if the good news has not happened in your life yet, if you have not had a gospel collision, Jesus says, your will is to do the will of the devil. And that seems terrible. And that seems really hard to understand. And I just want to take for a second and pause and say that the truths of Scripture have to trump our experience. Because you're going to meet some really nice people in your life. And they're going to be good people. And they're going to give a lot to charity. And they're going to help old ladies across the street. And they're going to be sweet. And they're going to be in rebellion and rejecting Jesus Christ on the cross. The Bible says that all they can do is be a slave of corruption. And you're going to say, I don't understand this. They seem like really nice people. But my Bible says they're a slave of corruption. What am I going to believe? Well, I hope you choose to believe your Bibles. Because the truth in your Bible has to trump your experience. And it should give you a great sense of urgency that not only is this person not pleasing God and not headed for heaven, they're a slave to what they're into. This is life and death business here. But not only is it life and death, it is a matter of freedom or slavery. We have a bunch of people today that are all into social justice and boy howdy, I'm not going to get started into that. But if we want to see real freedom in people's lives, first we have to recognize that there is a slavery. And if you have not experienced Christ yet, if you do not have a saving faith yet, if you have not repented from your sins and turned to Christ, you are a slave to your sin. Which is why you find people and they sin and they sin and they sin and they say, I don't like my sin and they don't know why they can't stop sinning. They don't understand why this thing has a hold on them. They don't understand why they can't lick their alcohol problem, their sex problem, their drug problem, because there's slavery involved. There's bondage involved. Their heart is captured by the devil. But God is sovereign. Remember? God's king. And all those these people are in bondage by the devil, guess who gets to boss the devil around? Well, that's God. And so even when people are in bondage by the devil, God can use them to accomplish his will. And that's what he's doing with the Babylonians. Babylonians and Nebuchadnezzar are in bondage to sin and the devil, but God is still going to use them to accomplish his purposes. And he's also still righteous to judge them for the evil things they're going to do. Because Nebuchadnezzar are just like Hamlet, although Shakespeare has written the play, God has raised up Nebuchadnezzar and the Babylonians and is going to have them go destroy Judah and wipe them out and take them into captivity. Although God is raising this up to happen, at the same time, you're going to watch Nebuchadnezzar happily choose to sin and do what he wants the whole time. He's still merrily going along this sin way. He doesn't even know he's in bondage and captivity. And if he did know, he'd be happy about it. These are your friends who when you witness to them and you say, man, I don't want you to go to hell. And they say, I'll go to hell because all my friends are there. They're happily choosing it every step of the way. And that's what we're dealing with here. And I want to take you over to Romans chapter 9 for a moment. Romans chapter 9 is going to be very important as we try to understand this passage. Starting in verse 14, what should we say then? Is there injustice with God? Absolutely not. For he tells Moses, I will show mercy to whom I will show mercy, and I will have compassion on whom I will have compassion. So that it does not depend on human will or effort, but on God who shows mercy. For the scripture tells Pharaoh, I raised you up for this reason, that I might display my power in you. 
and that my name may be proclaimed in all the earth. Now, for those of you that don't know your Bibles very well, when God says he raised up Pharaoh, I hope you're not under the impression that because God is going to display his glory and his name is going to be proclaimed, I hope you're not under the impression that Pharaoh was a really nice missionary dude who went and told the gospel. Pharaoh is an evil guy, and he captured the Israelites, and he put them under horrible slavery. But while Pharaoh is sitting there saying to be or not to be, what is the question? It appears that God is writing the play. God says, I raised Pharaoh up because I was going to do a good thing. And how many people throughout the Old Testament look back at the similar work of God of bringing out his people from the Egyptian slavery? God says, I'm glorifying myself in this. I'm taking care of it. I'm using someone in bondage, but I'm still going to glorify myself. But then also he gets to say, I still get to judge them. And this is the very uncomfortable hard part for us. Because as we're sitting here, and we've got, and I want you to remember this, we've got finite minds trying to comprehend infinite truths, right? We're not God. We can't understand God. If you haven't had a mind-blowing experience, let me explain the doctrine of the Trinity to you sometime. I'm still working through that one. But while we're with our finite minds trying to understand an infinite God, a lot of times the question comes up right here. Well, if God is using this person to accomplish his will, and they're in bondage to slavery. How can God righteously judge them? If God has a hand in this evil stuff they're doing. Why can God still punish them for that? That seems terrible. And it offends our 21st century sensibilities and our ideas of justice and fair and what love should look like. And that's why I took you to Romans 9, and we're going to pick it up in 19. You will say to me, therefore, why does God still find fault? For who can resist his will? But here's the answer to our question. But who are you, a mere man, to talk back to God? Will what has formed it say to the one who has formed it, Why did you make me like this? Or has the potter no right over the clay to make from the same lump one piece of pottery for honor and another for dishonor? So the answer to your question when you ask, Well, goodness, how is God going to raise up a Babylonian king? Let him go do a bunch of evil and then judge him for doing all the evil. How is God going to let that happen? The answer is that you're asking the wrong question. The question to be asked is why in the world does God ever save anyone? If God's law cannot be kept by anyone and he is incredibly glorious and holy and mighty and righteous and I'm not. How does he save anyone? How does anyone ever get to come to God? Well, love John 3.16 is what I was going to throw out there at you. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever should believe not perish but have everlasting life. A woe is God's judgment on those in willful bondage against him. I want you to understand that it is willful bondage. Not only are people in bondage, their hearts are captured by sin, but they're enjoying this. They're okay with this, and they're also choosing it. So a woe is God's judgment on those in willful bondage. All right. I told you that it had to get worse before it got better. And I told you to remember what? Someone has to say, I have a woe problem. I have a woe problem. I'm going to wait till more people say it. I have a woe problem. All right, so I've gotten you through all, all the bad parts. We've got some crazy things going on. God is judging people. They're in bondage to their sin, and we have a woe problem. I'm not going to leave you to go out to your depression counseling just yet. I actually have some good news to tell you about next. The good news goes back to that Galatians 5.1, where Paul says, For freedom, Christ has set us free. Stand firm, therefore, and do not submit again to the yoke of slavery. We've also got... John 3, 16, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, whosoever believes in him would not perish but have eternal life. We've also got Romans 6, because that same Romans that causes people trouble in chapter 9 also gives us something really cool to know about in chapter 6. Romans chapter 6 and verse 17 says this, But thank God that although you used to be slaves of sin, you obeyed from the heart that pattern of teaching you were transferred to. And having been liberated from sin, you become enslaved to righteousness. 
See, this is where I just twisted some people up again. Because you thought for a moment that I was going to talk about the people that are in bondage of their heart. They have a captured heart to sin. And then John 3.16 and Galatians 5.1 and the freedom comes in and bam! I've accepted Jesus Christ. I've repented for my sins. I'm now following Christ. I'm born again. The Holy Spirit's in my life. I'm doing my thing. I'm free. Well, is that what verse 18 says? And having been liberated from the slavery of sin, you become enslaved to righteousness. And this is the hard truth that I get to tell you this morning. Your heart is in bondage to someone. Your heart is either in bondage to sin and the devil, or your heart is in bondage to Christ. And I want to explain to you that there will be times that you'll meet people, or you might even have this thought yourself, that, well, you know what? I'm not on the devil's side. I know he's wrong, but I'm just not doing the God thing right now. I'm just not going to do that follow Jesus thing. I'm not going to do that wholehearted commitment thing. See, it is a lie from the pit of hell for you to think that you can stand between bondage to sin and the devil and bondage to Christ. You are either wholeheartedly following Christ and wholeheartedly on his path and wholeheartedly enslaved to righteousness, or you, my friend, are deceived and in bondage by the devil. Right. So there's the question you have to ask. Where is my heart captured? How do I know? Well, the question is simple. Does your sin bother you? Does it bug you when you have a sin problem? Young man, young woman, when those temptations flare up because of your crazy hormones right now, do you think, man, it's tough to live a pure life, but I sure love Jesus. God, help me live a pure life. My friends aren't living a pure life, but God, help me, I want to live a pure life. You know what we call that? Having been liberated from being enslaved to sin, you are now enslaved to righteousness. We've got adults that have to ask the same question. Don't think I'm just talking to the youth here today. We've got adults that like to sit on the fence and say, yeah, you know, I believe in God. I believe in Jesus, but you know, I don't really need to spend any money on the God stuff. I don't choose to spend my time there except maybe a couple Sunday mornings. I don't need to be telling people about Jesus. These are the worst kind because the devil has them exactly where they want it. In bondage and not knowing they're in bondage. And is that the scary thing? I hope it is. I hope it scares you that you could be in bondage and think you're free. But if you think you're free, you're already in bondage. You're either enslaved to sin and the devil, or you're enslaved to righteousness in Christ. Your life has the fruit of that. I don't know your life. There's two experts on your life. And it ain't Pastor Joe. It's God and you. You know where you're enslaved to. You know where you're at. We're not going to go much further into this passage today. My time is running short. We talked about what a will is. We talked about who said it most. And I'm going to explain the passage to you really fast so you can understand it. You ready? Taking stuff that's not yours is bad. Okay? <laughs> Taking stuff that's not yours is bad. Now you understand Habakkuk 2, 6 through 11. But the thought I want you to go home with today as we begin these woe articles is that you and I have a woe problem. If you have not run to Jesus Christ and repented of your sin and accepted his work on the cross for you, that he died for you, you have not run to that. You have not accepted it. And you have not said, Christ, my life is yours. I need to follow you now. If you have not had that gospel moment in your life, then my friend, I'm here to tell you that you're a slave. Your heart is captured. And I want it to be uncaptured by sin. And I want it to be captured by Christ. Amen. I'm going to stop talking so the Holy Spirit can do what he needs to do. I'm going to pray for us this morning. Heavenly Father, we love you so much. Help us, Father, to recognize and see the need of those that are enslaved to sin and the devil. Help us to be able to tell them about their slavery and show them that they can be liberated from that. And then to tell them about this new kind of slavery to righteousness where we follow Christ and we sing like the song, our heart is prone to wander. Bind it, Lord, to thee. Bind us to you.